Welcome everybody, Tally Book Troubleshooting Live, coming to you from the heart of the Permian Basin. I'm your host, Keith Stelter. Uh, Tally Book Troubleshooting brought to you as always by Arc Energy. We process your energy. I am here at the Horseshoe Arena in Midland, Texas. Boy, sometimes, you know, it's just a matter of forgetting where you're at. <laughs> I'm here at the Produce Water Society. Let me show you a little bit of the crowd there. People walking around, just got out of break. And I've been invited here to kind of, you know, have a few guys chat, tell me what the Produce Water Society is. My son asked me this morning, he's like, Dad, is that, you know, water coming out of the tap? And I was like, no, son, no, no, it is not. But uh, before we get to my first two guests here who are just eager, very eager to join us today, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, Sky High for Kids coming up September 8th. Uh, big banquet here in Midland. We're raising money. I'm donating this big mop of hair. I'm not usually a big, long, hippie hair guy. Uh, oh, yes, comments. Please let me know if you can hear me all right. Summer Chanter, good morning from Houston. Summer, thank you as always for checking out my live stream. I really appreciate it. If I could ever help you find candidates, let me know. Bo, thank you, sir. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Man, it's like my first live stream, starting all over again. Terry Cook, thank you for tuning in. I'm on it, forward to it. I guess you can hear me then. Sound must be coming through. Appreciate it, everybody. Let me know if it's echoey, echoey or you know anything like that. We're gonna have a try and have a good time here today. Uh, so donating money for donating my hair, raising that, kind of competing with JP Warren out there. JP, if you're tuning in, a little friendly Houston versus Permian, maybe uh, competition there. Um, I see you're still ahead of me, so I'm doing my best to try and catch up to you, sir. Lawrence, thank you for tuning in, sir. Let me know where you're watching from as well. Oh, man, Bo's coming in from Lafayette. Case de Jean. Sir, coming in from Houston. Really appreciate it, sir. Let's, you know, let's not dilly-dally. I'm sure my batteries on my, you know, some of my cameras or... Microphones are going to run out. Let's get to the guests. That's what you're really here for, right? You know, not me prattling on. You know, I could do that all day. Gentlemen, Steve, Ben. Good morning. Not, not Sam, right? No. Ben no. Samuel, sir. Steve Coffey, thank you for joining me. Man, do we got the shot proper here? Let's see. Do I got to adjust this camera just a little bit? Excellent. Gentlemen, wait. tell everybody who you are, what you do. Steve, let's start with you. Steve. change so kind of a jam-packed morning and uh ben samuels uh technical chair for the event uh out here in permian uh, this week for a uh, water society and uh president of the source record history as well excellent i think i screwed up the sound by taking me off the screen for a moment steve i'm going to get you to redo your your sure. intro <laughs> uh it's technical well, glitch all my fault nothing to do with steve steve <laughs> audios uh, no sound yes it's, a, it's the problem between the chair and the keyboard. It was me. Definitely me. I know what I did wrong. You so, I'm the user error part of the Steve, take two. This is as amateur video as it gets. Yeah, Go yeah, for it. That's good. Uh, I can hopefully give you something to, that viewers are interested in. But uh, as I mentioned before, we'll, just, we'll come back to the Permian. Um, we've been away for the last two years for COVID. And I think you know, the thing that we're most interested is see the people hear what. Uh, you know, what's changed, what's going on, and kind of the burning questions that uh, the oil and gas community has in the Permian. So um, we, we did one like this, uh, a little bit of a different flavor in Houston uh, back in February. And uh, we'll see a few of the folks from Houston and around the world join us. And of course, our virtual audience is, is, is lively as well. Um, but it's really great to see the people in the Permian, in the Permian, uh, especially since, you know, 
really too, probably too busy to jump on over to Houston. So again, this is something that we've done for six years and we really enjoy the, the exchange of information like this. So in case you didn't hear, uh, Steve, you're the president of the Produce Water Society, right? I am. This is my second term. I took a little break. I handed the baton off to uh, Lisa Hinthorn. Uh, she's with us today. She's also uh, running a DOE Cradle uh, uh, Project, which is a, a great beneficial reuse um, off the water, produce water optimization. And uh, we actually are having a meeting in the morning, right and early at 6.45 tomorrow before, the, before this meeting starts. And um, kind of getting into the game, there's about 38 folks in um, from DOE and, and other participants. Um, Karen Work also are joining um, previously with Pablo Phillips from the area from New, uh, New Mexico. So great group of people. Um, again, jam packed uh, technical uh, sessions. We have panel sessions that are very lively and interactive. One just got out. Um, uh, oh, sorry, we're going into one here in a bit. And we've got five actually. So it's, it's going to be a good array of topics. Uh, we won't have a shortage of things to, to uh, discuss. So for those who may be around the Permian area today and, you know, didn't know about the show and maybe they're seeing it right now, what can they expect if they come down here? You can see in the background, you got some nice equipment displayed here. There's a few booths. What are, what are, what are some of the highlights? Well, I, I, besides the technical uh, event itself, which Ben uh, Samuels, their technical ch chair, put together a stellar program. But really, I think it's all about the networking and the people and the, the you know, the communication of the product and the services that are being offered. You know, we're kind of surrounded by a lot of product uh, and uh, companies kind of showing their wares. Um, so I think the networking combined with the... The kit that's being, you know, shown off and the companies that are here, not only supporting the community and Bruce Water Society, but also hopefully benefiting as a solution provider or service provider and having that open dialogue with uh, the Permian operators. So I try and get as many outside the oil field people as possible to kind of tune in. It's part of the, my little, we need good PR. What's produced water in this sense of your society? What, what you know, what, uh, break it down to someone who maybe doesn't know what it is. So, so produced water in, in the most basic general term is water that's produced or comes up as a byproduct to oil and gas production. Um, Does that, you know, it's just for people out there, is that from yeah. regular water tables? Is that, you know, a lot of people worry that the oil and gas, that we're hurting the water tables. This is way below the water table, correct? This is far down below the surface. Right, and, and there, that's, a, that's a really good question. And that's actually why Bruce Water Society is actually partnered with Groundwater Protection Council. Uh, they are here in, in uh, I'm not sure who all is here quite yet. I haven't seen everybody, but um, I think the folks... Um, we, again, want to have a collaborative environment where people in water in general, not just produce water, but we want to keep um, tabs on where the water is uh, coming from, where it's going to, what's being done with it, is it being stored, is it being treated, is it just being disposed of? There's a wide range of things that you can do with it. So produce water management has become a really interesting topic, especially in the unconventional market, which, again, we've been around in the good Mitchell applications for forever, but the shell play really has made the unconventional market very different, um, very unique. With, you know, a lot of unique problems and solutions, but also a different, really a different community. But for the most part, we really want to think of produced water as a byproduct that is a valuable resource, not a waste stream. So the big difference that we're trying to reiterate here is with these folks that are going to stay is really we want to think about uh, how to better use uh, produced water and reuse recycled produced water as a valuable resource and not something that's a problem or something you have to get rid of. So not only environmentally, we, you know, trying to add some responsibility there, um, just being better, you know, stewards in general to, to the community. And also, really, if you do it right, you can make better money. So if you do, it, we you, love can, money. you can do oh. it right and do the right thing and make money. So that's really the ultimate goal. And I think, you know, again, if you fully understand the whole life cycle of, of water, you, you'll, you'll do much better. Uh, for the I agree. Do you feel, you know, 
I, I grew up in Canada. I started my career up there. Uh, Wireline, one of the largest uh, operations I was involved in. It's this big project up in northern Canada. And uh, they actually used produced water. This was like 15 years before the frack, right? A lot of people talk about, you know, you use a lot of fresh water for the fracking. Is the Produced Water Society, are they a big advocate of trying to get more produced water being used as fracking to utilize some of these resources? Is that one of the things? For sure. We actually have a uh, pipeline um, by this gentleman that's watching us. I didn't, I wasn't quick enough on the draw. He looked in it. Anyway, he and I uh, and uh, our members and about 30 some companies all got together a few years back pre COVID and came up with something, not a standard, but kind of like a guideline um, for, for that um, uh, water and that water is how to be used. Uh, and one of the uses would be for fracking. So definitely that is a key uh, part of you know, doing more with what you have. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. I mean, there's a lot of initiatives that we could tackle. Oh, I, I imagine that it's endless, right? We have yeah. a question. No, it's, it's, you can take it any which way. Ben, I'm going to let you take it. What are you using it for? I'm assuming water. produced water. What is? What do you hope yeah, everybody uses produced that's water That's a great for? question, and that's really largely uh, at a macro level. That's sort of what we're talking about at the conference uh, over the next couple of days. Um, just the beneficial reuse looks at taking that water and being able to reuse it in a, in a way that's beneficial to uh, other stakeholders, and that, so that can be for ag use or for some other like industrial jokes. You know, it, it, um, although people will joke about it. And um, yeah, so, so you know, in reintroducing it back into the ecosystem in some uh, you know, regenerative or, or beneficial way. Uh, and, and like uh, Chief, like you mentioned, uh, being able to use the produced water much more frequently and in a much greater percentage when compared to fresh water when doing you know, fracks and, and operations. Um, and so being able, again, be able to use that water in a way that, you know, even if you're disposing of it, disposing of it in the appropriate and prop proper ways, given pressure, new seismicity, and some of the other things that, you know, uh, that, that we talked about sort of in, in, the, uh, in that conversation. So another question coming in here. We love questions, right? We love audience participation. Terry Cook coming in from around Austin, Texas, soon to be Knoxville, Tennessee. And Terry does produce water need to be a certain quality cleanliness in order to inject or re-inject into the formation. So that's that's a fantastic question. Um, really, it's, it's very regional uh, in a lot of uh, ways. Um, out here in the Permian, especially, um, there's um, so there's something called an SRA, uh, which is a seismic restriction area. That's not right, but that's based, uh, that's that's what the acronym sort of stands for. Um, and, and it talks about uh, the Railroad Commission has designated certain areas that for one reason or another, whether it be pressure or seismicity or some other uh, market-driven reason, that there is a, uh, a capacity cap on um, on where that water can be disposed of. And I say it that way in answer uh, to Terry's question here, because when you look at reintroducing that water back into a formation, you have to be aware of you know, what other contaminants may be in the water present that may not be subsurface. Um, and so when you're talking about whether you're disposing of it or using it again in operations or again uh, the beneficial reuse and being able to reuse it in, in some other sort of outside industry way, each of those are going to take a different pr procedure to clean and you're going to be looking to get to a certain spec of cleanliness depending on what that use case is. And, and just to clarify, you know, disposal, we're talking about usually SWD saltwater disposal well, so it is being reinjected into the brain. And for those in, in the audience who may not be familiar with, with what salt water disposal is, in brief, that is, like Steve mentioned, that's taking the water that is used in and coming and being produced through the operations of oil and gas wells and re-injecting it into a subsurface uh, formation, whether that be at 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 feet underground to, uh, to be able to store or, or re, you know, um, or reuse that water uh, in, much more uh, effective. So I had the you know, uh, opportunity to be at the flare elimination uh, you know, uh, round table earlier this year at the Petroleum Club, and uh, some great technologies there. One of them was using flare gas to treat, produce water that basically could be 
use back in fracks or ultimately irrigate irrigate land. Is that one of the goals of the Produce Water Society is to, you know, basically really clean this up so that there is no limited use for the produced water? Or is there another kind of benefits that you're, you're hoping to, to see? Boo! Texas number one. Well, we're sending you a lot of people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm signing off. We're going to bring in. We're, oh. we're, we're calling in the righty. Oh, okay. uh, Jay Keener is going to come uh, come join us. Okay. Well, while we're doing the team switch, uh, so just to get some my further ideas on that. You know, whether it's a solar come in, project. sir. Come in. This is this is amateur video. MJ. Nice to meet you, sir. Have a seat. Have a seat. Go ahead. Finish your point. And we'll we'll get our introductions here. If it's uh, you know something like you know beneficial uh, use in California. Yeah, we're looking at various different ways to uh, further use as both non oil and general purpose applications, uh, as well as like solar, for example, you mentioned a flare application. There, there is definitely a whole uh, of applications where, uh, and, and really renewables, uh, play very much in line with some of the problems that we're trying to address here with use water, oil, and upstream oil and gas production, are very similar uh, when it comes to dealing with water. Uh, so I think there's a lot of crossover and lots of lessons left. Definitely, sir. Who are you? Let everybody know. Introduce yourself. This is, like I said, this is LinkedIn. This is Tally Book Troubleshooting. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is Jay Keener. Um, I'm a career, career long produced water uh, everything, I guess. A lot of uh, a lot of new technology, emerging technology. Done work uh, all over the world, onshore, offshore, mostly Permian for the last six years. Uh, water midstream, water recycle. Perfect. Um, we have a question. Seems like right up your alley. Okay. Couch Price asks, "What's the biggest outside the industry use for produced water?" Biggest outside the industry use for produced water. There you go. This is challenging at its best. Come on. Man, that's well, taking on your on feet. Spot question. Um, I have to use the restroom. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I wish I knew the answer to that. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm I didn't. Uh, you know, ultimately, I, I, I was hoping that you know, there's tanks, there's all kinds of other places where they need water just for compression or other you know, areas like that. Cooling is it ever used in cooling systems? Like, it does. I don't know, it might be crazy. The nuclear power plants, that kind of stuff, yeah, where it doesn't been used for some industrial purposes. And also in, within the industry um, for um, road programs, for dust control, for road mix programs, like in Canada, yeah, I'm still doing some of that, where they actually take the byproduct of produced sand, uh, which is produced when you pull the oil and, and gas and water up. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to reuse it for another purpose and uh, you know, for, for creating better roads to uh, travel on to and from site. Construction industry, for sure. Yeah, I, do, I, I do think, I do think it, you know, the question raises a good point, though, in general. The, the use of produced water outside of the industry in general is very minimal. Yeah, I mean, it could be one way to reach the public. Like, yeah. a lot of the reason I, I got you know, wrapped up in doing this show was I, I figured the oil and gas industry doesn't do a very good job of its own PR. What it, you know, some of the technologies and things that have been produced in the oil and gas industry that go out into medical and in a lot of other different areas. Um, so me, produced water could be one of those next steps where, you know, there is a lot of worries. Like right now we're in a kind of a drought here in Texas, right? If we can clean up that produced water so that it's irrigating, you know, uh, pasture land and stuff like that, or using the construction where fresh water gets saved, I think that's a win for everybody, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a look at uh, you know, sand mines use quite a bit of water and they use it in especially local sand mines where they're mining the sand for fracking. Um, there's certainly a big heavy work at agriculture type type applications, but we're we're so we're, there's so much in in the way of contaminants in, in the water, solids, scale, all of that. So there's a lot of challenges for any of those reuse. One hundred percent. We're also joined by. Uh, Oh, Kevin yeah. Burns. It's a fan. Mr. Jake here. <laughs> Kevin, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Throw me uh, throw me an easy one, Kevin. Would really love that. <laughs> yeah, come on, Kevin. You can do it. I know it. Terry, 
I know you're still watching. JP, what do you want to know? JP Warren tuning in. He actually just flew in from Houston. He's watching. Throw us a question. What do you want to know? Are you coming down to the show, JP? Is that why you're in town? Probably not. Just, he, he's uh, up. Oh, did you hear that? Pass with your name on it, JP. They love JP Warren at the Produce Water Society. Come on down, sir. So, you're here, Reclaim Water Services, correct? Mm -hmm. What's what's the big announcement? What's the what's going on? What's the number one thing going on over in your world right now? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, so I'm presenting today at 11, actually, in about 45 minutes. Oh, wow. uh, so, uh, so Reclaim Water Services is. They've approached the industry with something that I think is a long time coming. It, it gets the response of, wow, why haven't people started doing that? And that's, you know, produce water infrastructure in general, historically, is, is very traditional, standard tanks, standard approach, everything around treatment, reuse, uh, thinking about beneficial reuse, other industry applications. It all requires additional steps, additional equipment, additional services. Yes, so what Reclaim's done is they've taken everything you need to efficiently separate oil and water, manage solids, treat water to a high spec, whatever you need your water to be. They've integrated that into a facility design. So instead of installing a traditional tank battery or traditional SWD facility, you install Reclaim Water's smart SWD facility. Oh. And it now has all of the oil handling. We like that at Arc Energy. Down. We build process equipment, and meter runs, and all kind. You you name it, separators and treatments. He, he's heard that the gentleman I just uh, spoke about that was leaving uh, is, is joining us. Here. Yes. Morris Hogan wants to jump in. We were just talking a little bit about the um, the guidelines that they published. What was it, 2019? Yes, it was. Here, I'll let him join you, Steve. Come on down. You want me to let him join? You? Hello. I'll sit out for a second. Okay. Sir, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's see if we can get, if I can get you to scooch a little bit closer. Yeah. Well, there we go. Sorry, we're limited on our cameras. This was kind of thrown you together. What you got to do? Last minute, sir. Tell everybody out there who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm Morris Hoagland. I'm a oil field water specialist. I've uh, been doing environmental projects for over four decades. Uh, I operate. We got gotcha. you. We're good. I uh, operate a small company called Jade Dragon. Uh, actually, my wife's company, so I work for her. I, she had this company when we lived in China years ago, okay. and now I use that as a platform for dealing with uh, oil filled water issues uh, domestically and internationally. Excellent, sir. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us here. We're we're live here. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe we have one or two people watching i don't know it, it, it varies from time to time now nah, i'm sure I'm sure we at least got five that's the nature of nature of the business of right? this is the right conference to be at if you're involved with oil-filled water issues you've got folks that in, don't necessarily make the buying decisions but they influence those decisions these are the subject matter experts for our industry this is the largest collection of them you'll find any so one of the questions that just came in here, you know, how far are we from the technology? Basically, any chance yeah. of making produce water into drinking water? Absolutely. Is it too expensive? How far are we away from that? The technology questions. has been there for a couple of decades. Is it too expensive? How thirsty are you? <laughs> how thirsty do you need to be, basically? Well, how that's right. I mean, I've worked in some pretty dry areas, and water carries a value. I live now in southern Louisiana. It doesn't have so much value. No, sir. There's plenty of it. But here in Odessa, it hasn't rained in my house at least for two or three months. So it has more value. And we're getting there. closer to that. The technology is there for drinking water today. But it probably doesn't make sense. You have other sources for drinking water that don't require the infusion of CAPEX and OPEX making okay. irrigation water we're a lot closer to being there right now so you say that i i love the idea of that especially we're out here in the desert i'd love for all the produced water to start making this nice beautiful green area and everybody can stop telling me odessa you know it's too ugly to live in so you know, one of the benefits that west texas has uh you know for that type of water is the in general the land can handle higher tds water than some other areas 
You know, so that's that was a discussion topic earlier this morning. You know, there's talk about oh, it needs to be three thousand parts per million TDS for land application. Talk to a lot of landowners; they're taking brackish water at six, seven, eight, nine thousand TDS right from the ground, applying to their crops. They've been doing it for generations. That that's that raises like the bar it. a little bit in terms of how clean it needs to be. So there are some good advantages to this region for, for getting there. Uh, I love to hear it because uh, produce water, I, I think, could be one of those bridging you know, technologies between a lot of different environmental groups and the oil and gas. You know, they say we're running out of water in a lot of places. Well, we got tons of it. We just you know, haven't figured out a way to make it useful for everybody yet, correct? We have the way, it's the cost. Cost, it's the cost. correct. And what can impact that would be, for example, policy. Policy. We've got our folks in Austin. They can write legislation that makes it more attractive or not, basically incentivizing putting that water on the ground in a useful way versus putting it way down hole in a disposal well where it's gone forever. For sure. Now, the industry by and large thinks, well, policy is bad. That means regulation and that costs us money. But good policy is a good idea. For example, you got policy against drunk driving. Well, that's good policy. Well, it could be good policy to treat these waters, to put them back on the ground, and we're not so far away. But that's the type of incentive that makes the industry move. I agree. I, I, I love the idea of more and more water. It's, uh, it's one of the most valuable you know, water, uh, substances on Earth. You can't live without it, right? Yeah. Steve, I'm going to let you join the conversation back in here. Thank Please. you, sir. I appreciate, appreciate you having it. me. I I, uh, I apologize. My first question uh, stumped you. I well, thought for you know, sure you were going to just crack it out of the park. Nothing you... like coming right into a new group of people and falling on your face. You did not fall on your face, but <laughs> now I feel face. bad, and you'll never talk to me again. And I mean, Kevin Burns, he's a big, tall guy. He'll probably get after me for, for doing that, aren't you, Kevin, if you're still watching? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> But Keith, we appreciate having this opportunity to talk with you. Man, I, I you know, learned so much for coming in these things. I, I was a you know, wireline guy for 20 years around the world and upstream. And now that I'm getting more into the midstream and, and water management, that it's it's very interesting and it's kind of rejuvenated my interest in the oil and gas industry. So I a couple of weeks ago I had a modular refinery guys on who can build you a refinery. Uh you know, very small footprint where you don't even need federal regulation. They can do it right here and you got gas. Uh, this, I, I love the fact we're getting closer and closer economically. I, I'm aware the technology has always been there. We're cleaning up the water. I, I really believe that that will be a big bridging story between the oil and gas industry and a lot of environmental groups. If we can just start producing, fill up Lake Mead. The oil and gas industry would build Lake Mead back up with clean water. Man, that would we'd be we'd have friends forever. I think you know something like that. This this industry is a really more of a water uh, business. Uh, oil is the byproduct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had an instructor at Slumberjay years and years ago. He's like, Slumberjay is not an oil finding company; it's a water finding company, and I uh, that stuck with me for many many years. Yeah, yeah. Like local lumber right now is about eight to one. Yeah. Uh, depending on where you're at, you know, range from one to one to 22 to one, kind of an average um, with some regional differences and then the conventional versus unconventional and then some offshore numbers. So there's quite a range, but a lot, lot more water than oil. You know, uh, good question here. From a safety perspective, dangerous H2S in the water processes, how are they working around that? So that's you know, you got benzenes in the water, you got a lot of salts, uh, all kinds of stuff. Is there any newer technologies treating H2S right now? Not necessarily newer ones, but very effective ones. Some of the wells are sour, which is where the H2S comes from. That's hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell that folks uh, sometimes will notice around some oil and gas operations. But it's not difficult to remove at all. And it's never an issue, really, in re using the water because the upstream treatment we're going to be dealing with removing all of the hydrogen sulfide long before it gets used in another application. In your opinion, what's one of the best ways to, to remove 
the well, H2S. Well, oxidizing it is very easy, and it's often just stripped out, but oxidizing is the most common. Excellent. Steve, any anything to add to that? No? Oh, you That's gotcha. Yesterday. Okay, no, no. <laughs> reading the room, reading the room. Keith, I'm going to have one more gentleman for you. Perfect. You're out of here, nice, sir. Nice, Keith. Appreciate it. Very nice to meet you. Your microphone, Pop if you wouldn't mind, just switching it over. Maybe there's people there still go. watching. Let me know where you're watching from, if you still are. This is Morris. May I help you? Love the comments when they come in. Excellent. With the microphone. Let's see. I got one. Sir. I don't know. Oh, sir. Scooch yeah. together. I know I'm I needed a better. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. You can clip yeah. it on. Yeah. Take your time. Yeah. Nobody's watching anyway. It's yeah, all that's, good. That's good. Nobody's watching. Everybody's watching. They <laughs> you're taking a bathroom break. Sure. Or maybe the microphones, the sound died, the battery ran out. Sir, go ahead, tell LinkedIn who uh who you are and what you do. Hi, everybody. I'm Raz. I'm the Vice President of uh, Business Development. I'm with Hydrozonics. Very nice to meet you, sir. What, so what, what does your company do? Well, Hydrozonics has been in the forefront of managing produce and flowback water since the last 12 years. So basically, we have a cutting edge technology that we enable the oil and gas operator to treat the water in a cost-effective way, in a sustainable way, to recycle and reuse more. So that uh, most of our technologies are very environmental friendly. So we're also taking into account the ESG side of it uh, with less carbon footprint, less chemicals. At the same time, we're being very cost effective so that we can conserve our rare resources of water, waste water and brackish water, and then try to reuse and recycle more produced water. Excellent, sir. So, so I actually have a day job too. So yeah, oh. we, we actually work together a bit. So my, my company um, that I work for is Produced Water Solutions. Uh, out in Lafayette, so we're a global company. Uh, focus, my focus, uh, fairly new, um, but I've worked with the, the guys there and gals for many, many years um, in previous life, and uh, looking forward to um, kind of relaunching what we're doing internationally in a bigger, uh, more effective way, and also just bringing more solutions um, to some technical problems um, where I've been in the industry for about 20, 20 years now. Um, so if I look old and tired man. <laughs> you don't look old give me a break so what is you know every company you know solves solutions give me an example like somebody came you with x problem you solved them with y what give the people out there an idea so, so right now uh, the biggest challenge of uh, using produce water is like treating the right amount so that uh, they can take care of all the, the risks that impacts the, the frac fluid, their assets and their formation, right? But So what are the KPIs, but what are the things that's really bad that's gonna hamper their frac fluid, their assets and their formation? So things like iron, things like bacteria, which in the oil field we call SRB, sulfate producing bacteria, acid producing bacteria, right? Uh, S2S, resolved S2S, uh, suspended solids, uh, Iron, which I already mentioned. So with our technology, let's say, if they are doing a right, they need to reuse the water. All they need to treat is iron, suspended solids, on and off, bacteria, uh, and then dissolve S2S. So with our oxidation technology, we are fully automated on an oxidation technology that takes care of all of this. So they can treat it 120 barrels a minute when they are fracking on, fracking on the fly, and then reuse that water. Or we also have the same technology can be used if they are doing a pit treatment uh, in a centralized facility or in, in a mobile site as well. That's just one example. And plus, like we heard today a lot about seismic city and then seismic response area. So there is a limitation in disposal, right? So we have evaporation technologies to address that. And we call it smart evaporation. Smart means salt management and recovery technology. So one of the challenges of evaporating produced water is that produced water is very, very salty. So if you evaporate the produced water, it will spread on the nearby ground and contaminate the soil. We don't want that to happen. So we have our automated technology that will help keep the salt inside the pit to evaporate the water. We have aeration technology just to address the, the, the bugs, the iron and things like that. And, and we have some other, uh, we got hydro flare technology where we can use access flare gas to gas and to evaporate that water as well. 
so we have several technologies going on. I'll let Steve talk about yeah. the so, so definitely, you know, the chemical and biological aspect of it, in addition to all the mechanical methods that are out there, including gravity, but also just looking at the management of water from a when and where and how much and what quality, you know, getting this to where you need it in the right quantity at the right time is key too. So there's a lot of aspects that go into it besides just the physical and, uh, you know, chemical aspects of, of how to treat water. It's, you know, how you manage the logistics part of it. So uh, Permian has done a really great job um, in the last, you know, six, seven years of developing proper infrastructure and management. So there, we really should be seeing more reuse and recycling here because uh, that's one less excuse to, to, to really uh, use. But again, like Norris Hudson just said, you know, it comes down to money and, the, you know, how, to, how it factors into the economics of getting it from point A to point B or do you store it or do you dispose of it? And there's a lot of different different recipes that you can use. Let me, let me add to that point because logistic and infrastructure is so critical because most people think it's just based on the technology, right? It's not the technology because the hydro flare technology that we developed, we thought we can use excess flare gas and then to dis, I mean, treat the water, evaporate the water, desalinate the water. We said that was a perfect fit for the Permian because they are flaring. Flaring is an issue because of all the uh, greenhouse gas emission, right? And then we have water issue, and we thought we can cover both bases. But then we realized where there is excess gas, there is not the water. So they are not in the same right place. And if we try to bring them together, it costs a lot more than other options. So the technology is there, but infrastructure and logistics plays a greater role with us at particular technology applies in a cost effective way or not. That's exactly what uh, Steve so was mentioning. So you mentioned the evaporation. We kind of have a question here. You know, less chemicals, more membranes. Is there different in your, what situation calls for one or, or, or the other economically? Is there a difference? No or, or, or yes? Go for That's it, gentlemen. It's your, you. I mean, I'll take a real simplistic approach. I, you know, it'd be great to say, here's the best solution. Um, but it always, there's always some give and take, I think, depending on where you are. Uh, the operator, what the operator's previous experiences, what, you know, what they have in place. There's a lot of factors that, that come into that recipe, how to make for the best solutions. So it, that's that's really one of the biggest challenges is matching those pieces together. Uh, but that's also the fun part too, because not every uh, situation is, is the same. Thank goodness, because we'd be really bored if it was the same thing over and over and over. So for sure. It's a great challenge, for, and, and if it's a challenge that you know, everybody experiences. That's my viewpoint on it. Yeah. I have to keep uh, I keep, keep myself entertained after doing this for 20 years, so I appreciate the, the challenges. For any for any problem, there are multiple solutions, right? So, I mean, there is a saying, you can skin a cat in different ways. So, I want to be politically correct and say, you can peel a potato in different ways, right? Using different... When it comes to evaporation, definitely mechanical treatment is the way to go because it's hard to evaporate water chemically. But it, even in terms of mechanical treatment, you can use different technologies, like Heating way, membrane technologies, I mean, uh, nozzles that we use in our technologies, right? So which one is better? It all depends upon the pros and cons. What is the cost? What are the logistics? And, and does it help to mitigate some of the risks evaporating produce water? That all comes into play. And besides that, I mean, every we all have different opinions about uh, different vendors. So if, uh, let's say if Steve is already working with an operator A, and Steve has provided it five different solutions, and evaporative is one of the issues. Maybe my technology might be slightly better, maybe slightly cheaper, but still, if, if uh, Steve is already working with that particular uh, operator, eh, the solution that Steve will provide in terms of evaporation, they might go with that route. So that that confidence level and, and that uh, relationship also plays a better, bigger role when choosing which technologies people go. Some people surely definitely explore different technologies to a pilot and pick the best one that they think. Some people go based on the relationship and who they know and what they have heard, what they are comfortable working with people. Yeah, and hope, hopefully coming to an event like this really makes it easier to make the decision. You're not going to learn everything and get all the answers, but at least you know the, the, the chapters of the book and the foundation to be able to make better, better choices and ask better questions and you know, provide uh, you know, maybe management. Hey, here's some ways we can do it. So I think it's a great way to um, you know, beef up your resume and kind of get them, um, you know, being exposed to, to new ideas. Excellent. You know, this kind of, you know, when you mentioned the bacteria, I'll, I'll admit 
you know, it exposed one of my biases. When I think of produced water, I just think of it being salty and there's chemicals and H2S and I don't really think of bacteria. How big is the bacterial problem? What kind of bacteria do you encounter? What, uh, you know, what, what do you find down there? Can you kind of give a brief overview? Yeah. So it's uh, bacteria in produced water is one of the, the major issue because bacteria, generally there are three types, but most people talk about two types. They call SRB, sulfate reducing bacteria. Okay? It reduces the sulfate, it converts into sulfur. If there is iron in the water, it creates iron sulfide. Now, iron sulfide is a salt, it will create scaling issues, it will create uh, corrosion issues, and things like that. Okay? Uh, the other one is acid producing bacteria. So acid producing bacteria literally produces acid. If you have acid in the water, it will enhance your corrosion. Okay. So both of these are bad for the water and also for the frac fluid compatibility. When I say frac fluid, most people frack with spit water. So with their FR, friction reducer, or pans. So it's, it's a very big issue. And there is another one, it's called iron reducing bacteria. Most people don't talk about, but most people treat iron anyway uh, with oxidizers and things like that. So SRB, APB, and IPB are the other three major bacteria in, in the produced water. And it's definitely, it has a bigger market in terms of treatment. Because if you look into it, most chemical company or most water treatment companies have some form of oxidation technology to address that. And you can treat bacteria two ways, either with an oxidizing biocide or non-oxidizing biocide. The non-oxidizing biocide are the chemical solutions out there. Okay. And there's a, some of them are like glute quad, uh, PAA, and things like that. PAL oxidizers. And then oxidizing biocide are the ozone, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, bleach, and things like that. So definitely bacteria is a big issue. And the treatment market is also decent for the, for the bacteria and technologies. Awesome. That's, I, I really didn't know like that bacteria there with the presence of you know the iron would, would cause all that scaling and stuff. So that's that's really good. You know, from a guy uh, who used to do wireline logging, we used to analyze, you know, some of that buildup where it was from the caliper logs and, and see, you know, a lot of it we think of rust or wear, but uh, scaling definitely was an issue. Uh, I, uh, let's see, Terry is like, I've heard the term, what is slick water? Okay. I believe slick water, that's from fracking, isn't it? Or is that something else? Yes. So when fracking started, in the beginning, most people were doing gel fracking. Okay. So at that time, they are using goa, which is a viscosifier to create a gel that helps to carry the problem down hole. And then the reason to carry the problem is that when they are putting it in high pressure, all this oil and gas are in a formation in the rock, right? So you have to create a rock uh, fissure, crack, and those prop and go in between the cracks, and then that's helped the oil and gas to, to back. But uh, go out became a little bit expensive. Okay, so the, the that way of fracking became a little bit expensive. Uh, and then also the water quality needs to be a little bit higher water quality. So you cannot use uh, let's say water with boron because most of the processing gel they're using boron and every produced water has boron. So people have started looking into uh, efficient way to frag it. Then they found uh, it's called the uh, friction reducer, which are the polyethylamide. So what it does is that the friction reducer, it slicks the water, means it creates, it reduces the friction. When you are injecting the water down the hole, it reduces the friction so that you can inject it higher pressure. So that's it's called slick water. So water with friction reducer, which is primarily polyethylamide. Now they could be anionic, Anionic, deuterionic, non-ionic, but it's basically a water with polyethylamide, which they call friction reducer. That's what they, they call slick water. Excellent explanation. It's more in depth than I would have went. I would just went. That's what they used to frack with and get the stuff out. <laughs> uh, great question, uh, Alexander Price. Uh, these bacteria are they native to the formation or are they introduced by drilling? Most of them are native to the formation, I would say. It's not something that's introduced uh, by fracking uh, or drilling. Are there some then areas or formations, you know, more dense, like more susceptible or where this exists more often? Yeah, so it's just like the S2S issue because there are some wells that when the produced water flow back water comes out, it's very high S2S, right? That's a dissolved S2S. Yeah. Similarly with the bacteria as well. And, and because these days, the level of bacteria is growing because anytime when you commingle the water, when you mix different water, because right now, because to reuse and recycle, people are mixing the produce and flow water from different wells. They're also mixing with fresh water, brackish water, some of with the municipality, waste water. When you commingle the water, bacteria finds food that's very good for it to grow, like phosphate and things like that. 
So, and if you store it for a longer time without treating it, oxidizing it, aerating it, when it brings to the surface, it grows exponentially. That's why those oxidation technologies, those bacteria uh, treatment technologies are in rise and in use. But most of them comes from formation. When you bring it to the surface and, you, and it has the right environment, they grow exponentially. That's why it's a problem. Excellent. Terry, what do you mean by GAR? Guar. Oh, it's guar. Guar is a yeah. viscosifier. It's, it's a, it comes from a plant, which is kind of a vegetable, mostly grown in India. Uh, there were some uh, guar uh, growth in uh, Texas as well, but it primarily comes from India, 90% of the guar. It's, it's, a, it's a plant. You can also eat it as a vegetable. It's a viscosifier. It's a chemical that it is also used in our cosmetics. Yeah. So if you are using your uh, no gel, cream, anything like that, it's a viscosifier. It's also used food grade gar, I'll use in uh, ice cream and things like that in everything. So Excellent. It, it, it helps to create gel. Look at you, Terry, on the ball, just get, uh, getting it out there. Alexander says, thank you. Uh, sir, thank you very much. That was great information. That just came out of nowhere. I loved it. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Well, thank what you. else you got for us, Steve? Do we got any more guests? Anybody else you want to feature, oh, sir? Oh, oh, oh. I can take this don't in. steal my don't steal my microphone now. We're recycling the mics too. So. Yeah. <laughs> we're so if you're just tuning in, we're coming live from the uh, Produce Water Society here in uh, Midland, Texas, at the Horseshoe <laughs> Arena. I'm from Odessa, so you know I drive into Midland, you know, begrudgingly, you know, because you know it's like that no anybody out there watching we're, we're from midland welcome, still we're welcoming uh everybody even the folks from houston got quite a few of them here today yes sir there's we got i wonder if they've got any canadians here I, no matter wherever i go i'm always running into canadians there, there's a couple canadians it's, that, uh, that are known might be a few more uh so uh speakers have started back up yep haven't they so that's why it's a little bit quieter in here the internet's probably working a little bit better uh, I don't know where Ben disappeared to. Is he looking for another guest for us? Is uh, what's the plan here? Good question. He's wandering. He's he's our technical chair, so you know maybe he's doing something technical. Oh, maybe he's <laughs> doing something technical. Uh, well, yeah, no. I, this this group this uh, group that on the technical committee really did a great job this this year because um, you know putting all this together and giving something that somebody you know that. People that are attending as delegates and tuning in uh, virtually, I uh, got to have something interesting to tune into. So that's really the focus of getting something that's uh, relevant and, and current, and uh, you know, hopefully, just you know, technically correct, and not just an opinion or something that's being promoted. We we've kind of frowned upon that commercialism, so we get a little bit uh, more of a uh, technical flavor in our event. So it's it's a great group of people. Oh, it, it seems everybody's very professional, and uh, man, there's some big displays in here. I don't know how you got that one truck in here. One, maybe I could. Yeah, we've got some, uh, this up, some, some 20 and 40 footers, uh, and some smaller pieces. I know well, that's but... across the room there, but that thing is massive. And we have uh, this in our background. Ryan. This going a little bit. Well, sir, anything else you want to close out the show with, or well, do you yeah. got somebody else coming, or I, I I don't unless we can. I think everybody else is busy uh, busy learning, watching but, the speakers and one, stuff. Yeah, but one of the things that we definitely want to do is um, we're just not focused on an event or events. We you know really throughout the year we want to build the, the community and get back and have the exchange. You know, whether you're an operator or equipment supplier. Uh, you know, technical supplier, wide range of folks. We have a lot of academia here from UTPB. Um, so we're encouraging people to get more active on an ongoing daily, weekly basis. Uh, you know, join, become a member, um, BruceWarsSociety.com. Click on the become member now. And, you know, it's a great way to stay engaged and stay current throughout the year, not just once a year when we come out to the Permian. How many members do you have currently? Good question. So we have a couple of different ways to track that. Uh, globally, I would say we have our community is about 5,500. Um, right now, current, uh, I'm not sure what the current count is. We're, our website's giving a little bit of a, a little bit of a, uh, 
challenge for us to try to update our library. And when we did that, um, all the dates kind of got messed up. So if you if you are looking at the library, not everything was published on the same exact day. Um, that, that, that's an error, but uh, we'll try and fix that. Excellent, sir. And you said this is your last year as your or your head. I, 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 I got one more year left oh. as, as, as the president. Um, I, we'll, we'll see. It's an elected position. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, definitely something that's it's great. To, to be in the lead, but it's also just great to be a, a member or on the board. Uh, there's a lot of interesting, you know, places for technical committees, uh, members, subcommittees. Um, you know, if if unconventional is not your thing and you're offshore, you know, especially for the Houston event coming up in uh, February, it's a 33rd annual event. We've got a, a lot of need for offshore folks. So if you have interest to, to play a role, there's always a, there's a place for uh, if you've got some time to volunteer when, and, you know, again, it's, if you are on the committee, it's a great place to actually get back, you know, and answer some questions. It's a great way to, to get networking. So, um, you know, stay, stay refreshed with technology, but also just be in general, you know, uh, keep in touch with the community. And Ben's back. So, uh, you mentioned you're in from California. Yep. California has a reputation that doesn't really like oil and gas. Is that is that true? Is that different? Is that certain sections? Uh, that, is, that is true. What yeah. what is without getting too political, political or anything? You know what 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 is the situation and how can we improve it? Yeah, I mean we have some great operators um, out in California, and I, I you know they they're challenged by uh, operating in California, but it, there's a lot of natural resources. Um, there and uh, you know I think it's a combination um, from oil and gas to you know solar and wind. We have uh, a lot of the other you know renewables, bio plants. There's a lot of similarities. Also, I, think I mentioned earlier about uh, with water and water treatment and water management. So I, again, I think it's probably perception um, and you know some regulatory uh, aspects. Um, you know it is harder. Uh, you know, it, there's more challenges in California um, from from a uh, business standpoint. Not so much technically, but there are different technical challenges. Um, so, is there anything sure the industry could do as far as you know, telling its story or featuring or something that could help that situation out? Are there people willing to listen in California to help improve? I want to interject quickly, and you're obviously the subject expert because you live there, and I live out here in West Texas, but. But I will say that out in California, one of the things that I have noticed really in you know, uh, the coast, but California specifically, is that really sort of by design and by happenstance, they have found themselves sort of on the front edge of these benefits for reuse and how to do, how to or, operate in the industry effectively and efficiently. And a lot of the things that I think, I think that, are, that are being talked about are the, the, the impetus is spot on, but sometimes maybe the implementation or the execution is a little bit off because of the regulatory and policy. But, but you know, out in California, you know, you've seen desalinization. You've seen some of these major market drivers really been sort of piloted out there by, by I shouldn't say by force, by, you know, by choice. By necessity. Um, I mean, by, thank you. That was yeah. where I was looking for, by necessity. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I think that's a really important piece that, you know, I think there's some things that, that are happening out there that maybe, you know, we might be able to, uh, to benefit from. Yeah. So, no, I mean, the same goes. That's a, a perfect spot on observation. Um, you know, any anybody that lives in a, a dry or uh, water scarce area will identify with that and, and, and hone in on those factors. You know, uh, New Mexico is a great example. So, yeah, the similarities. Uh, there's, there's, you know, where, wherever there's a uh, something on in the con, uh, there's always a pro that kind of offsets it. So, definitely, you know, using and beneficial reuse and recycling. Uh, water for other uses is great. Well, definitely, like we brought it up, irrigation, you know, California, they'd be, you know, loving the fact they could get another supply of water, right? So I think that's one of those bridging areas that could, you know, connect a lot of people, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Chevron, uh, many years ago, did a Fern River project that is quite successful for beneficial reuse. So, um, you know, we just need to do a lot more of those sort of things. Excellent. Sirs, we're going to close the show here. I think an hour is enough. Don't you agree? 
close, maybe. We got, we got a bunch of uh, people circled through. We got uh, got to cover a number of things. I think this is great. Man, you taking the time. We had some technical questions come in, and we just had an expert just going, just click, 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 answering. Gar, I got we got asked about. And I was like, Gar. <laughs> And he, he knew he, exactly. If you're not careful, your listeners are going to ask for like just to be, be a weekly spot. You know? Oh man, great! We we can do that. We're next week actually. I'm supposed to have try to confirm my friend who has some helium wells over in Arizona. So he's exactly. gone from drilling here in West Texas to going to Arizona and producing helium, which helium is big, big and getting big. big, big with yes, sir. We're Hopefully, I can finalize that by the end of the day and start advertising that. I wish I could have advertised this a little bit more. We kind of had some, you know, back and forth. We we're, we're going to do that. We're going to do this. And so, hopefully, a few people tuned in after a while. It uh, was uh, definitely worked out, I believe, right? I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Sirs, anything else covering the show goes? Today and tomorrow as well, correct? Absolutely. Yep. And uh, you know, if you're in town, uh, you can get, get a day pass. Come, come join us. If you're not, uh, you know, in town, still want to be, uh, you know, plugged in here. What's going on? You can, uh, uh, you know, pick up a virtual pass. So we still have those registrations open. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's been a great event so far. Looking forward to the rest of it. I uh, want to know more and more, especially the guests that came through here. I was like, oh man, I uh, I need to do my homework a, a lot more uh, for coming into something like this. Uh, it's uh oh, Alan. Thank you for checking it out, sir. Thank you, sirs. I enjoyed it. I valuable troubleshooting modern. Maybe uh we can do something here in the next month or so. Follow up. Uh, maybe there's some big revelations at the end of the show. You, you never know. Is there any events going on tonight? I know you had like a little bit of a gathering last night. Shout it out. Get some. Uh, we do. Yeah, definitely join us tonight. We have. Uh, Big cocktail networking event here at the Horseshoe. Last night was a uh, uh, second story downtown, but um, tonight we're here. Keep everybody on site and some uh, food. So definitely, if you're you know if you're around, uh, swing on by. What, what time is that? Uh, uh, six to eight. Six to eight. You yeah. heard it here, it gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Six, yeah. Yeah. Six, six. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank Sir, you. Loved loved being here. We'll do it again soon. I'm sure. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Everybody, once again, Talibut Troubleshooting coming to you live from the Produce Water Society here at the Horseshoe Naria in Midland, Texas, part of the Permian Basin. Odessa, where I love to call home and uh, cause trouble. And speaking of trouble, I'm going to get into some trouble September 8th, the Sky High for Kids Banquet. Going to be cutting my hair. Uh, Can I check take out. The clippers? Huh? Can I oh, take the clippers? Do you know how many people have asked to be the clipper guy? It's going to cost you money. At this point, I think Janie Snelson has been pushing. If you don't, if you don't know where to donate, I don't have the, the clip or the link handy right now. Horrible, horrible guy I am. Go to Janie Snelson on LinkedIn. She's done a couple great posts for me. She's gotten people to match her her donations. Check it out. Uh, kids with cancer, kids with terminal diseases. They're helping all kinds of people here, right here in West Texas. Great event. Uh, look forward to anybody. If you want to know more, reach out to me or reach out to uh, my guest, Ben Samuels. You're on the committee as well, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, next week, maybe Helium we'll be talking about. Still checking it out. Uh, you know who you are out there, sir. You got you to gotta confirm with me and we'll get this going. So, till next time, everybody. That is how you troubleshoot. We will...